Hi, welcome to the Fit and Healthy Today Show, and I'm your host, Heike Turciano. Today we'll be discussing the flu, or AKA influenza. Um, when we talk about the flu, generally the flu versus a cold, a lot of people have a difficult time distinguishing between which they have. The flu usually moves in swiftly and quickly, and it attacks with a vengeance. Whereas a cold usually gradually comes on, you feel it, you kind of get a little run down and you're tired. The flu, boy, you'll get the sore throat, and the next day you got the fever and chills. So when we're looking at flu, what flu is, it's an acute viral infection of the upper respiratory system. This right here, okay? I know a lot of people say, I've got the stomach flu, and flus can, you know, once they hit the uh, upper respiratory, they can also affect the stomach as well. But the most common symptoms of the flu for most people are fever, body aches, fatigue, sore throat, and a <coughs> dry kind of cough. Um, some people then also experience then that vomiting, nausea, they get little swollen glands, they'll sneeze, and insomnia, and actually it can even bring about a little bit of bout of depression as well too. Um, when we're talking about flu and its causes, oh, everybody, you know, I hear so many things, but it takes the flu about 48 hours before when you're exposed for it to hit the body. And depending on how good your immune system is, is going to be how well you're able to fight it off. Some people get very nominal flu symptoms. I had the flu uh, three days ago. I had it for half a day, and it was pretty much gone. I started yanking some of the things that I uh, talk about here later on uh, to help me get over it very swiftly and quickly because I'm a working mom. I can't, like most people out there, I work and I can't be sick. But the flu also can come down. Uh, stress can bring the flu down uh, as well. Anything that causes um, physiological stress, be it emotional, uh, not eating right, uh, all those wonderful things, anything that brings that immune system down. Now, there's another uh, theory about the flu, which is kind of unique. You know how when you get the flu, you kind of, sometimes you'll get diarrhea, you don't want to eat, you just don't feel so good. Uh, it's almost like your body's all of a sudden detoxing. Well, hmm. It seems as though, from some of the research that I went through, and, and it revealed, basically, that the flu actually can be a detoxifying time. Uh, the body sees that it needs to detoxify, and it'll make that virus hit you pretty good to where you don't want to eat, or if you do eat, you want to eat things that are really easy and light. So, when you do have the flu, here's some recommendations as far as the diet. You want to eat pretty lightly. I know a lot of people, especially people who build muscle or work out or that type of thing, they're worried about losing their muscle. Or someone who's extremely thin will worry about losing weight. Um, now, you don't want to look at flu as a good way to lose weight, but most people do lose a little bit of weight or, or tonnage, so it would be the case, uh, um, when they have the flu. When you have the flu, the diet, you want to eat lightly. A lot of fruits, vegetable soups, uh, steamed veggies, things that are really easy on the digestion. And believe it or not, those are also things that help detoxify the body. You want to drink a lot of liquids, water, you know, the good old chicken broth, you know, that hopefully mom or somebody that loves you will make for you. Um, you, can veg you can juice as well, vegetable juices. Uh, a lot of hot water with lemon can help soothe the sore throat. Lemon also alkalize the blood. Um, remember, viruses and bacteria love an acidic environment. So these things that we talk about on that list, the vegetables and the good fruits and things like that, really alkali the blood. So they do help you to recover faster, but they also detoxify the body really uh, well and get rid of all the gunk. Um, you, there are other things that you can do to help with some of the nausea. Uh, increase the consumption of ginger, onions, and you can put some garlic in, in the soup. I, I don't recommend sitting there and <laughs> biting the garlic clove, but if you like it, that's okay. I have one son, uh, when he gets sick, he'll take the, we have this liquid garlic at our store, and he'll take the liquid garlic and shoot it in his mouth whenever he gets ill. And garlic is an antimicrobial. That means it kills viruses and fungals and bacterials. So, but the garlic and the onions, and then onions and garlic also has something in it that we've talked about before that Ralph has mentioned called quercetin, which is also a very strong upper respiratory antioxidant, which is kind of a, a cool thing from a food source as well. Um, 
you're gonna avoid all sugars and simple carbohydrates. So, downing the diet soda or soda, you know, oh, this is gonna make me feel better, or eating a lot of the sugar or any of those kinds of things, really causes the immune system to suppress. And I think I said this before, one teaspoon of sugar suppresses the immune system for four to six hours. So, if you wanna get over this quickly, you get your sugar consumption down. Now, I'm not talking about things like carrot juice or that type of thing. And if you're a diabetic, even carrot juice would be out of the question. And so would the fruit. So keeping that in mind, you would want to do more vegetables and bras if you're a diabetic in that regard. Um, avoid caffeine. Now, caffeine, as we know, is a natural kind of diuretic. And coffee or these mon some of these monster drinks, oh my gosh, have tons and tons of caffeine in them. Caffeine causes you to lose minerals, particularly zinc. And one of the best antiviral things that you can do is zinc, particularly if you get a cold. I have these zinc lozenges in my store that people will slam. And it does stop the replication of viruses, and the flu is a virus. So when you're drinking a lot of caffeine, uh, out goes the zinc, and then you don't have as good of an immune uh, immunal response. I'm going to take a peek at here some of the, the supplementations that we know help with the flu or fighting off the flu or lessening its duration. Um, there are uh, some several good flu homeopathic remedies, one of which comes in a white box. It's Ossel and it has a long name. We call it Ossel in our store. And it is found to be over 80% effective if you catch the flu within 24 hours for the symptoms of the flu. There are other flu remedies, uh, homeopathics, or several companies that make flu. Those seem actually to be one of the most effective ways to overcome the flu symptoms besides the diet part that I talked about. With me, I started, when I had my little minor flu, I started slamming the homeopathics and then some of these other things all at one time and boom, it was gone at the end of the day. So, um, elderberry extract, one of the most popular antiviral agents in Europe. Elderberry has a lot of clinical research and as I noted on here, there's medical journal studies that show 90% of the people were well from the flu within two to three days versus if they weren't taking anything at all just a, what we call a placebo. They do these double-blind placebo tests, and what they do is they'll give you the medication, or the, in this case, uh, the elderberry extract. Elderberry is a, is a berry. And then they'll give another group none and see who recovers quicker. And the elderberry group, only two to three days suffered with the flu versus the ones who did nothing. A good six-day duration. The flu for six days is, boy, that'll make anybody depressed. Um, Echinacea golden seal, uh, very good for the immune, and it's extremely antiviral. Now, echinacea and golden seal, there's some disputes as to whether or not you should take them all the time because they are antimicrobials. Um, they do tend to help with stimulating the immunal response, and golden seal actually is kind of like a little bit of a natural bio, um, antibiotic. So you probably don't want to take it all the time, but when you're fighting something, especially the flu or a cold, and you feel it coming on, you could take the echinacea golden golden seal and it can work to, uh, as an antimicrobial. Oregano oil. What's really cool about oregano oil is, like, uh, like I mentioned uh, a couple of times before, oregano oil fights off viruses, fungals, and bacteria. So sometimes when we get the flu, especially since the flu is generally uh, respiratory related, it can go into our bronchi or our lungs and turn into viral bronchitis or viral pneumonia. The viral bronchitis and pneumonia are the most common forms of bronchitis and pneumonia, not bacterial. But what's cool about the oregano is it can prevent it from becoming the bronchitis and the pneumonia, be it bacterial or viral. Very, very strong cure in the cupboard type of thing that you can do. But it needs to be a special type of variety of oregano oil. It's not your standard cooking oregano. It's a vulgara form, different variety than we generally cook with. Uh, Ester C increases the white blood cell count, and it also is a wonderful way to detox and get the body cleansed out so it can better respond immunowise uh, to the flu. Uh, I have a recommendation of about three to 4,000 milligrams. You can do as much as the bowel will tolerate. So how you know you're getting too much of the ester C is if it, you start getting diarrhea, although sometimes with the flu, you don't know. Uh, you're gonna have some diarrhea sometimes anyway. But if you can do 1,000 to 2,000 three to four times a day, 
that would be recommended when you're fighting off the flu, and particularly ester C, because it's really, it's buffered and it's really, really easy on the stomach as well. Ginger, all right, ginger we use a lot for nausea, be it in our pregnant women or be it in someone who's suffering from nausea from the flu or because you ate something bad. But ginger is more than just something that settles the stomach down. It also has a lot of antiviral, antibacterial uh, factors to it. It also is a very good anti-inflammatory too, so it reduces inflammation down. But you can do ginger in its natural form, ginger teas or there's ginger capsules, it also helps with motion sickness on the boats or if you uh, have an issue like I do, anytime you get any type of rocking motion, ginger helps settle down, down. but it helps with the nausea that can go along with the flu. Uh, colloidal silver. Colloidal silver is silver and what they've done is there's a special process in which they, uh, these silver um, water is exposed to these silver ions. It makes a very good antiviral, antimicrobial, antibacterial agent as well, can help with the flu. I mentioned before garlic, um, how my one, my 10 year old will grab the garlic bottle whenever he feels something going on. And, and garlic has been used for centuries, actually even in Russia in World War II, it was considered a natural antibiotic when they couldn't get a hold of antibiotics. They would use the garlic uh, for wound treatment or internally taken or bronchitis or pneumonia as a natural way, or the flu, as a natural way to help overcome the viral or bacterial infections. Um, Dr. Andrew Weil promotes uh, astragalus uh, for prevention. Now with astragalus, you have to kind of be careful because you don't want to take it with a fever. So it's a very good prevention type of thing to take uh, to keep you from getting the flu along with some ester C. Um, but once you have the flu, if you've got a fever attached uh, with it, I wouldn't do it under those circumstances. Um, beta-1-3 glucon. Um, you're like, beta what? <laughs> um, it's kind of funny, I have a lot of school teachers that take this right when school starts because what it does is it allows your uh, immune system to be able to identify a friend from a foe very well. So it can lessen the incidences of flus, colds, and other infections as well by making uh, the immune system ready and available without overstimulating the immune system. You can even take beta-glucan if you have uh, an autoimmune disorder. Um, so very safe and very effective for prevention. Takes it about 24 to 48 hours to work. Now there's a couple of things that I didn't write on here um, which I want to add uh, in addition. There are things called probiotics or the good little critters, the good bacterias, especially if you're dealing a lot with stomach issues. Um, if you're dealing a lot with stomach issues with the flu, those good bacterias can really help settle the viral activity in the stomach. And then if you've got severe diarrhea, adding in something called charcoal. Um, you can either burn some toast, or you, if you don't like to eat that, which most people don't, um, you can grab charcoal tablets. And what the charcoal does is it kind of absorbs the toxins being produced by the viruses and everything else, and you can also use it with food poisoning. Um, it can stop the diarrhea very quick. But to be very mindful with diarrhea, particularly in children when they get the flu, because they'll deplete something called electrolytes. And so if you do have uh, diarrhea or any of that type of thing, looking to stop or slow down that diarrhea with the charcoal and then using electrolytes either in a, in a liquid form, powdered form, it's very, very helpful uh, to replenish those minerals that you might be losing from either vomiting or from diarrhea. Um, I'd like to discuss some other issues at hand. I know a lot of times, uh, physicians uh, or other healthcare professionals are recommending vaccines and, and that's an option that you have to consider and, and I would not never tell you not to get one but I can tell you this if you do get a vaccine these viruses change and modify themselves like every three to seven years from what I'm reading and what happens is when you get the vaccine the next time that similar type of mutated virus comes along three to seven years you will not have the immune response that you would have had if you would have actually been exposed to that particular flu. And remember, if you're like my parents, when you get your flu vaccine, 50% of the time, they get the flu. So um, the efficacy rate of the flu vaccine, not proven as well. Um, and in some cases, actually, when people's immune system is down, it can attack at its worst. So discuss it with a really well-informed doctor, go online and read and, and determine whether or not it's a good thing for you. Um, for me, I choose not to. I 
fight things off so quickly because I know what to do and then my body's going to immune, be immune the next time it comes around or when my customers come in the store um, as well. Now with vaccines it's kind of interesting as well. My, uh, my 10 year old caught measles from a vaccinated child, a child who had just been vaccinated with the uh, three day measles vaccine and he caught measles from that child. So. Keep in mind that if you get vaccinated, you can become contagious to the people around you. It seems like I, I see more influenza once the vaccines start going into anybody than anything else. So once again, I don't want to discourage you, but I think you need to have all the information and facts and data to make a good decision as to whether or not it's right for you. If you do decide to get the vaccines, then you need to get them every year because otherwise the next time that virus comes along, it will attack you pretty much with a pretty strong vengeance. So um, something else I tell people to do, and they kind of look at me a little crazy, um, whenever you have respiratory types of issues, um, you know, they tend to affect the lymphatic glands because the body's responding and a little swollen and they'll kind of hurt and they'll swell down here. And what I tell people to do is, I, if they can, try to do 20 jumping jacks a couple of times a day. What you're doing when you move your arms and you're jumping is you get your lymphatic system to move the crud out of the body. So if you can't do jumping jacks, kind of move the arms up and down, and then you can grab a chair and you can kind of jump or bounce. Anything to get that lymphatic system moving to where you can move things along huh, helps it clear a little bit better. The lymph has a purpose, uh, but uh, it needs to be moved along. Now, for those people who are extremely sedentary or who are not able to do what I just showed you, then there are lymphatic massages that uh, you can either learn or there's, very, there's massage therapists. Most of them have a good working knowledge of um, lymphatic massage. And if somebody's ill or the lymphs are swollen, sometimes that massage and moving that lymph along with a good massage therapist uh, can be very helpful as well. Now, to conclude this, I <clears throat> want to give you my own personal recipe for flu and detoxing. And this is a wonderful soup that I make whenever my kids or myself get sick. And it seems to do the trick. And I don't know exactly all the reasons why, but I do know it does alkali the blood. Uh, and it seems to detox, and I always say a little healing prayer over it that it will heal, help heal my body and my children's body, but whatever your religious beliefs. But the recipe I have down here um, is carrots, celery, onions. Once again, we're dealing with the quercetin. Broccoli, zucchini squash. Ah, oh, I misspelled zucchini. Spinach leaves, uh, one cup of spaghetti sauce, and then whatever your favorite spices are. Boy, that would be an excellent time to go ahead and throw in your garlic and anything else you can throw on a little bit of thyme whatever you can you put the lid on it for about 45 minutes or so just let it kind of cook to where the vegetables are cooked through but not mushy and you spoon that out and you eat you know two or three bowls it will definitely help with some of the things i mentioned in the diet it's a quick easy way to get yourself on the way to recovery I hope that helps you, and we're going to be moving on to our next section, which is our fitness portion of our show. Hi, welcome to the fitness portion of our show. Today I'll be demonstrating an exerciser that can support and help strengthen the rotator. And, and that is this section right in here. Um, for athletes particularly or for people who throw balls or for the 47 year old guy that's getting out there or mom that's getting out there starting to throw the ball with their child or their grandchildren. The rotator is involved in that throwing motion. Um, what I'd like to show you is an exercise that will help strengthen the rotator and this is particularly helpful for athletes or people who have very, very minor rotator uh, stiffness or I should say stiffness, um, irritation or bothers them. This can help strengthen the rotator. And what this motion is, is you get in a 90 degree angle on your arm right here and you're going to grab a 2 to 5 pound weight on this and you're going to rotate it in an outward motion. Okay, just like this. Rotate it out, 
back in again. Now you can do this laying on the floor if you'd like uh, with additional re uh, resistance. Now if you have any severe rotator issues, I wouldn't do this, but if you're definitely a, a ball player or getting back out there doing the weekend warrior ball playing, I would add this into my fitness regimen to help strengthen that rotator. Next, we'll be moving on to our research analyst portion of our show. Thank you. Hi, welcome to the research portion of our show. And with us today, as usual, is research analyst Ralph Turciano. Ralph? Thank you for the intro. Now we have a few interesting articles today, but I'm going to spend a little bit of time on one particular item called bisphenol A. But to start off, another feather in the cap for honey. Well, it finds out honey is a little bit more powerful than a lot of us think. In a recent uh, research article that just came out from the American Academy of, I apologize about this, Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery Foundation, they discovered that honey is very effective at killing bacteria. In fact, it killed all forms of bacteria, and especially the drug-resistant biofilms that make treating chronic rhinosinusitis difficult, according to that research presented. The study authored by the Canadian researchers at the University of Ottawa found that in 11 isolates of three separate forms of bacteria, pseudonomas, methicillin-resistant, and staphylococcus aureus, honey was significantly more effective in killing both planktonic and biofilm film forms of the bacteria compared with the rate of bactericide by antibiotics commonly used against the bacteria. So I don't know how it's going to look putting honey up the nose, but however, if it beats the antibiotics, it beats the antibiotics. Just if you can, remember most of these studies are done in non-processed honey. There are natural honeys. Once you heat honey, you change its structure dramatically. After that, it's another slap in the face to women, especially from this time, Pfizer. A real interesting aspect in this was a top-selling medication, Lipitor in particular, and we can't say the name on this because it was released in the Journal of Empirical Legal Studies, it found out that virtually no evidence was found or any quality clinical evidence that showed any benefit to women whatsoever. And they say, quote, they could not unable to find any high quality clinical evidence documenting reduced heart attack risk for women in a primary prevention context. Furthermore, advertising omits label information relevant to women. Theodore Eisberg of the Cornell Law School and Martin Wells of Cornell University assembled a study meta-analysis of the drug's effects on cardiovascular risk, taking into account all relevant studies reporting risk for both men and women. They also said, quote, Pfizer claims a clinical proof that Lipitor reduces the risk of heart attacks in patients with multiple risk factors for heart disease does not appear to be scientifically supported for large segments of the female population. In addition, Lipitor's advertising repeatedly fails to report that clinical trials were statistically significant for men, but not for women. I Meaning they did the studies, they didn't pan out the way they wanted them to, and they just didn't bother telling you the information. Unqualified advertising claims of protection against heart attack may therefore be misleading. Pfizer's advertising also does not disclose critical portions of Lipitor FDA approved label, which acknowledges the absence of evidence with respect to women. And they said, quote again, our findings indicate that each year, reasonably healthy women spend billions of dollars on drugs in the hope of preventing heart attacks, but that scientific evidence supporting their hope does not exist, the authors conclude. Not to mention the side effects. So the next time you're thinking about taking a Lipitor and you're a female, unless there's really good reason to do that to support it by scientific information, I really don't think you should be contributing to any one particular pharmaceutical company's mutual fund or pension plan. After that, an interesting thing from the Harvard University. Cheating death is easier than you think. What they discovered is if you add up all your chances of dying, whether that be the 1 in 5 chance of dying from heart disease to the 1 in 3.7 million chance of being eaten by a shark, when you add it all up, your chance of dying on a daily basis is actually 110%. So, Every day, statistically, we are cheating death. But they did find out one interesting thing. 
were following 120,000 nurses for 32 years. Those that they found that those that exercised or ate well, which basically took care of themselves, had 55% of those deaths. Let me back this up. 55% of those deaths could have been avoided just by exercise and having a healthy diet. They also said that 44% of cancer deaths and 72% of cardiovascular deaths could have been avoided in just doing as little much as walking 30 minutes a day. That's pretty significant from a huge aspect, especially from a healthcare crisis. A little bit of it's kind of self-inflicted. After that, now we go down to a chemical you find in everything, bisphenol A. Bisphenol A is especially found in infant bottles, milk bottles, water bottles, you name it. They recently discovered that generally that large portions of the population, actually 90% of us, have bisphenol A in our body. They found that it contributed to cardiovascular disease, developmental diseases, heart diseases, cancer diseases, and basically mental retardation, including Down syndrome. Basically what these researchers did is, especially also with the Journal of American Medical Association, the JAMA, which did a noble job in this case, they wanted BPA removed with just tons of data to support that it should be removed altogether, including toxicologists itself. In fact, some of the studies that came out, just to give you the importance, accidents in lab animals raised questions about chemicals in plastics due to chromosome damage. Components in plastic bottles found the cause of normal pregnancy in mice, including Down syndromes. They found the chemical presence in clear plastics can impair learning and cause disease. Suspicion, and that was from Yale University, suspicions linger of bisphenol A in breast cancer because they found it spread the, the growth of ovarian and prostate cancers on top of that from Indiana University. Chemical use in food containers disrupts brain development, found from University of Cincinnati. They found out to show that the chemical interfered with the rapid, the rapid signaling mechanisms in the active in the developing and maturing brain. That was Dr. Belcher from Indiana University. They also found, and the nail in the coffin should have been, that they found, they found out that BPA was found in 90% of the population. They discovered it resulted in a 39% increase of all cardiovascular disease, angina, coronary heart disease, heart attack. And on top of that, those with the highest BPA concentration had a 2.4 times the odds of developing diabetes. What was the FDA's answer to this? Chemical. Restricted in babies, restricted in basically exposure to our children, restricted as a total part of the population, a look for alternatives? No. Their answer is it is safe. And it is safe in low levels. Even though every single one of these results was due to concentrations that were below levels deemed safe by the government. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ralph. We really appreciate your research and your time. We hope that this information helps you further look into and research for yourself and, and take this data and apply it accordingly. Thank you again for joining our show.